Hello, and welcome to the Cloud Security Alliance Zero Trust Summit 2024. I'm Jason Garbus, co-chair of the CSA Zero Trust Working Group, as well as CEO and founder at Numberline Security, a consulting firm focused on helping enterprises define and execute on effective Zero Trust strategies. In my session today, I'm talking about the five-step Zero Trust process and why it matters. So let's go ahead and dive in. We have four things we're going to cover. First, we're going to introduce what this five-step process is for Zero Trust. Second, we're gonna talk about the mission that CSA has taken on related to the five-step process to explain and expand it. Third, we'll walk through a sample scenario. Uh, and four, very briefly, we'll summarize and provide some recommended next steps for all of you. So we talk about the five-step process. We gotta step back a little bit and put this into context because it came out of this federal report that's called the NSTAC report. So the NSTAC is a federal committee um, for National Security Telecommunications Advisory Committee. It's a bit of a mouthful. It was created in the 1980s by President Reagan. And what it does is it provides the industry with a way to give the federal government, specifically the executive branch, uh, context and recommendations for how to define national policies related to telecommunications and security. T today, uh, CISA, or which is part of DHS manages this and has telecommunications and information security industry leaders participating in this. The most recent one uh, was this report that you can see here on zero trust and trusted identity management. It was published in February, 2022. And it was sparked by President Biden in 2021 related to the executive order that mandated zero trust for federal agencies. Now, this committee has 30 plus participants that rotate. And for this particular report, specifically on the zero trust angle, um, our, our good friends, John Kindervog and Chase Cunningham had uh, considerable impact on this. And in particular, um, you'll see John's fingerprints and, and uh, elements uh, throughout the report. Uh, other notable participants in this report or contributors, I should say, are the lead authors from CISA of both the zero trust architecture and the maturity model author. So I wanna thank all of them for donating their time and expertise to our, our federal government and to the service. And the, the information that came out of this is really, really useful. Now, the NSTAC report, as I mentioned, specifically is targeted at federal agencies or really to the US president who then takes the recommendations and applies them to federal agencies. And in this report, there's a lot of very federal specific elements in terms of priorities, programs, interactions, things like that. That's not relevant to what we're talking about today. Um, what we're talking about today are the universal elements of this. In particular, this concept of a protect surface that was formerly introduced here, the Kipling method for policy, and then most importantly, the five-step process. And these are things that I know John Kinderbach has been talking about and thinking about for a long time. And after he left Forrester, this was a great vehicle, a way for him to get that information out there in a way that is vendor neutral and influential on in the industry. But, and <laughs> it's, I would say, um, really important information that today is buried in this NSTAC report that isn't widely adopted in the industry because it's so federal specific. And this is what we at the CSA feel, these are really important and we want to get them out there outside of this federal report and we want to expand on them. And that's one of the reasons that we have, I'll jump to the conclusion, this uh, series of white papers that we're developing as well as going through this session here in this, uh, in this summit. So there's some key elements that are introduced here. So the first is this notion of data application assets or services, sometimes referred to DAS. Now this is not as a service, this is just an acronym for essentially the resources that 
are on your network, in your environment that need to be protected, that essentially make up protect surfaces. The concept of a protect surface is the smallest possible area that makes sense that your zero trust policy is gonna protect. And the way that John Kinderbach, when he introduced this, looks at it is your attack surface is really, really broad and enormous and constantly changing. Whereas the protect surfaces are really well defined, really well understood. And it's much easier to define access policies for protect surfaces, as opposed to the whole entire attack surface of the industry. Each protect surface has one or more components of data, applications, assets, or services. And we'll talk about this in a minute, but you need to understand, you got to be able to adjust the level of granularity of a protect surface. In particular, our position at CSA is, and I'll quote our, our white paper here, is that depending on the business requirements, a protect surface may contain a set of related DAS elements that comprise a business information system. And we really believe you should be looking at this from the perspective of business information systems. These are the components that you need to protect. How do you protect them? By defining policies. Finally, the NSEC report introduces this concept of the Kipling method policy. And the policies, of course, the only reason we're doing zero trust to begin with is to be able to define and enforce policies that define who human or non-human, who should be able to access which resources under which circumstances. Uh, we're allowing authorized access for the policies and we're blocking all unauthorized access. So Kipling method simply says, a policy needs to contain the who, what, when, where, why, and how. And there's lots of different ways to express that that, that depend on are dependent on the specific vendor platform you've chosen. They all fall into the same model of who, what, when, where, why, how. So now we have these ingredients of, we have these DAS elements that make up a protect surface or multiple protect surfaces. And the only reason we're doing this again is to be able to define these policies to enforce access to those protect surfaces. So the concept of the granularity protect service is one that we've had a lot of, let's say heated discussions about internally. Um, and the conclusion is that there is no one universal definition for how big or small a protect surface should be. And that what you have to take away from this is that they can be any granularity. You've got to pick the protect surface granularity that's right for your enterprise and for that particular resource or asset at that point in time. And you really want to try to orient yourselves from the perspective of, okay, this is a business system. And this business system has, of course, data applications, assets, and services, but it's also got transaction flows in and out. It's got enforcement points that I'm gonna be deploying as part of a zero trust architecture. And of course, it's got the policies around it. And all of those things have to be considerations for how big or small the protect surface needs to be. And the key here is that you wanna be able to get started quickly and deploy your zero trust architecture, your policy enforcement points, and to uh, be able to actually get identities making use of those policies for accessing those for tech services. So don't drown yourself in details. Don't try to map out every single asset, data element, et cetera, on your network in to the nth degree and map out every single transaction flow because you're never gonna get that done. Pick one protect surface, understand how it works end to end, deploy your architecture and your policies, get users using it, and then you iterate from there. And it's fine, not ideal, but it's fine if you make some compromises around the granularity of the protect surface where, okay, this is a pretty broad protect surface. We understand that, but we're still letting users move away from our terrible VPN. We're starting to enforce device posture checks or things like that. Um, those, are, those are reasonable compromises to make in the interest of getting your, uh, your zero trust system and your zero trust architecture going quickly. Um, so as long as you're on top of that and you plan to iterate and improve over time, it's fine to start with a coarser grained protect surface. So now let's talk about the five step process itself. And you can see them dis displayed here. And this graphic is from directly from the NSTAC report. So step one is to actually define the protect surface. Step two is to map the transaction flows for that protect surface. To step three is to build the zero trust architecture for that protect surface. Step four, create the policies so now you're actually operationalizing this and deploying it. And step five is to monitor and maintain, and by the way, improve as things go on. Now we're gonna step through each of these uh, using the language specifically drawn from the, uh, the NSTAC report, and I'll provide some additional commentary on those. And what you'll see is that 
there's not a lot of depth in the NSTAC report. I don't say that as a criticism. I say that as it's the, the report, of course, imposed some constraints on how deep uh, it could go. And the report itself is also not a technical uh, document. So <clears throat> the definitions here are very compact. And this is one of the reasons that we at the CSA decided we really need to expand on these things. And that's why we're creating dedicated white papers for each of these five phases or five steps. So the first step is to actually, okay, identify your data, application, asset, and services, your DAS elements that you're going to protect. And of course, there's lots and lots of these in any enterprise. So it's a question of how do you prioritize? And you might prioritize based on risk. You might prioritize based on level of maturity. You might prioritize based on maybe you have a new project that you are just about to roll out. There's lots of ways to prioritize this, and none of them are wrong. You just have to decide. Don't do them all at once. And don't start with the highest risk, highest value, most critical assets in your enterprise. That should not be the first one that you do. You want to make sure that you understand the process, the technology, the tools that you're using. You've got a comfort level. Anytime you roll out a new type of access or security system, there's going to be hiccups. There's going to be a few problems now and then. So pick the right audience and the right protect surface so that when you encounter those speed bumps or hiccups, it's not a big deal. Um, and by the way, especially in your pilot phase, you can keep your fallback access, your current access method in place, um, <clears throat> and you don't switch over to hard enforcement until, of course, you have a comfort level with the reliability, et cetera. So the second step is to actually map the transaction flows. And what this means is really understand how the data goes in and out of those DAS elements, the applications. Are users accessing this through a web UI? Is it an API call? Are administrators SSHing into a system? Is it a database thing? Is it a backup system? Is it a VoIP system using UDP traffic? You know, lots and lots of ways, and there can be a great deal of complexity here. But number one, you have to understand this because if you don't understand transaction flows in and out of a system on your network, you've got no hope of securing it. Again, you don't have to do this for every single application on the network because that is a years long effort, but you absolutely can and should understand this for specific protect services. And this is where you can also and should collaborate with the line of business owners who own or have responsibility for that application. And you can put the onus on them. This is a great way to delegate and say, hey, how is your application deployed in the network? What network interactions and firewall rules or access uh, transaction flows are needed. And the business owner should be able to tell you, yes, we know we need this network protocol and this port and that one. Um, and then you can compare that to what's actually happening in your environment. And hopefully there's no disparity between the two. But once you understand the transaction flows, then you can say, great, now we can actually build a zero trust architecture for this. And what this means is really it's, you, you want to have a, uh, ideally one uh, zero trust platform, one set of technologies in your environment. But the zero trust architecture that this refers to is really, how do I deploy my policy enforcement points for this particular application, or I should say protect surface, and how does it enforce it? There's lots of different vendors with lots of different architectures, way too many for us to cover in the 25 minutes that we have here. But what they have in common is they have the capability to ingest the policies that we're gonna create in step four, and then enforce them. And there's different ways to enforce it. They can enforce it by proxy in the traffic. They could act as a firewall. They could be part of the application so they understand application <clears throat> uh, semantics and data flows. They could operate at the data level, et cetera. Lots of different ways to do this. Uh, the key is to understand what capabilities do those platforms provide for you and how do you deploy those enforcement points that can then uh, make use of uh, or incarnate the policies that you're about to create in step four. Um, you can see here clearly, <clears throat> you wanna have your enforcement, enforcement points as close as possible to the protect surface. And the idea behind that is so that there's not a big implicit trust zone behind the enforcement point, um, uh, between the enforcement point and the DAS element um, in particular. Then we get to the only reason we're doing this was to actually create the policy. So this is where you define the who, what, where, why, not, why, how, and you want to make this as specific as you can. Uh, and we'll give some examples of that. Um, the specificity and capability that you have, are, of course, are going to be driven by what do you get out of your zero trust architecture? If it's acting as a firewall, you might have more limited capabilities than, for example, 
a zero trust enforcement point that's actually proxying the traffic and understands that <clears throat> you might have other types of enforcement points that maybe even really deeply understand the application protocol, like certain, let's say, uh, privilege access management systems can actually block specific actions that an administrator might take. Data-centric systems, of course, are going to deeply understand the data and you might have an enforcement point that could, for example, uh, mask out certain data, <clears throat> PII, um, depending on who the user is or what the situation is. <clears throat> uh, and then finally, the operational mode of it, which is to monitor and maintain the network. And clearly, um, seeing what's going on in the environment and having this identity-centric way to evaluate all the access is a big improvement for your SIM system and for the SOC analysts for, for, who are using it. <clears throat> One of the nice things that a zero trust system does is it disambiguates the network traffic so that, you, that these analysts and tools are not just looking at IP address A is accessing IP address B, but they know who the identity is, they know what the application is. And by putting that in context, it makes certain things much, much easier for them. Um, you should also use this phase to look at the effectiveness of your policies and improve them over time, especially if you started out with a coarse grain, um, a coarse grain protect surface to start with. Okay, so that's a five-step process. And as I mentioned, we think, we at the CSA think that <clears throat> this five-step process is really important, the elements that are in there, and it needs to be uh, explained to the industry and taken out of this U.S. federal report that not everyone is going to read, certainly, uh, and may not even have heard of. So what we've done in the industry is said, you know what, we, the CSA, in particular the Zero Trust Working Group, thinks this is so important that we're going to dedicate some time and effort to this. So we're creating a series of six white papers on this, one for each of the steps and then one overarching keystone document. And we've made some good progress here. We've already published step one, defining the Zero Trust Protect Surface, um, and you can see the link where that's available <clears throat> in the um, the resource hub for uh, the Zero Trust, uh, Zero Trust Working Group. The second document, Mapping the Transaction Flows for Zero Trust, that is uh, currently finishing up peer review and is going to be planned to be published in Q4 of 2024. So by the time this summit rolls out, it may well be published. Uh, the additional steps uh, are in progress. So I'm leading the group that's creating the, the white paper on step three, building the Zero Trust architecture. Uh, we're always looking for volunteers. So if you want to join our work stream on that, you know, please reach out to the CSA or myself or to, uh, to Eric Johnson. Uh, and steps four and five, those are in planning right now. Uh, they're on the roadmap. And we're obviously thinking about them, but are, de are deliberately writing and publishing the white papers in order of the steps. Um, and what this is going to allow us as a CSA to do is have uh, vendor neutral, non-federal, private sector focused, uh, private sector consumable resources that are going to talk about the five step process and give us the opportunity to expand on it in more detail. Um, so I'm excited about what we're doing here. and I think it's going to have a big impact on the industry. So let's go through a example here, actually uh, an example of uh, three different protect surfaces. So our, our hypothetical example is a traditional enterprise architecture in the financial services realm, uh, mostly on-prem business applications in the corporate data center. They're beginning to move certain applications up into the cloud environment. <clears throat> so they're relatively, let's say, technology laggards in that perspective. So in terms of defining the protect services, we've got three here. So first of all, we have our money transfer application, really important application, clearly, to the business. We're bank. Um, and we've broken this down into two protect services within that. So one is the web UI that users of that application use to do their jobs, to transfer money. And the second is administrator access to that system. And the web UI, of course, is just a web UI running on TCP port 4 for 3 using a browser. Administrators can access it either through the web UI because there's an admin console on that or to the actual operating system itself. What happens to be Windows, so the, those services have a remote desktop protocol or RDP running on uh, port 3389. So the reason I mention this is that clearly we have to ultimately in our policy to be able to define which ports and which protocols are secured because that's what the policies actually have to do. So it's important to surface these here. Um, the third protect surface is deliberately as an example, a coarse grain one, which is our employee subnet. We don't really know, there's lots of applications running on there. They're quote unquote low risk. 
uh, and they're just all web applications and every employee gets access to the stuff. There's a web UI for timekeeping for some users. There's an employee portal for everyone. Certain departments have certain applications on there. And we know that not all employees need access to every single app on the subnet, but we as an organization don't have a clear sense of who should have access to what. So you know what? We're going to compromise here and define this as a coarse grain protect surface to start with. Not great, but we're moving off of the VPN. We're enforcing device posture, better way to enforce MFA. We're still making improvements here. So for the transaction flows, you can see here, these are color coded. So the green, excuse me, the blue is the web UI for end users. The orange is the admin access and the green is things for the employees. So you can see here the web UI in blue for the money transfer app is accessed by both remote users via the VPN and on-prem users. The orange access pathway is for our system administrators who can be the remote or on-prem, uh, or the uh, green is the employee subnet. Uh, and that's accessed by anyone, whether the remote or on-prem. And if we think about what are our policy enforcement points look like, in this case, what we've done is we've added them uh, both at the entry point to the network for remote users, as well as in front of the specific uh, protect surfaces that we define. And you can see the color coding there. And we've decided in this case to require that all users have our zero trust client running on their device. Um, that's the case for most enterprises and most zero trust platforms. Um, I would say maybe 10 to 20% of the case there's, there's uh, clientless access just using a browser, but in many, certainly the majority of cases I've seen, most enterprises do require the client for corporate managed devices and for employees because they get better device introspection. So this is a obviously a generic example of where and how to place policy enforcement points um, close to or in front of the resources that are being protected. So let's talk about step four. Again, the only reason we're doing this is to create these policies. So you can see here, these are our policies and they answer the questions that are required, which are the who, what, when, where, why, how. So for the money transfer application in blue, you can see we're defining access over TCP 443. So it's web UI. It's people who are in the money transfers group and our identity provider. And what this means is we better have a pretty good identity management or identity governance process to make sure that only the right people are in that money transfer group. And that's uh, really important. It's really important for enterprises when they define these policies to realize that the policy is only going to be as effective as the data it uses. And I'm really keen on making sure that people understand the importance of having good, clean, reliable data in their identity management system to use as input into these groups. The rest of the policy for money transfer, money transfer application is people have to be using corporate managed device. It's got to be a quote unquote good level of uh, device security posture. Specifically, is it patched? Is our EDR client running? They can be on-prem or remote. That's okay. We, we offer both of those, but we do block uh, access from countries where we don't do business. Uh, and then we do require MFA for every new access session because this is such an important application. In orange, you can see the second protect surface for, or the second policy for this uh, component, which is the admin access. Admins, again, access both the web UI on TCP443 and remote desktop protocol and 3389. So those are the technical parts of the, uh, the policy. In this case, we're requiring that people are in both the admin and the transfer authorized group, again, we're entirely reliant on good data around applications, uh, application group membership. Uh, they got to be on a managed device. They have to have similar level of um, device posture. Uh, we do enforce MFA and we require that a service desk ticket gets assigned to this user. This is such an important application to us that we're not going to allow admins access to it any time. Only when they have a service desk ticket assigned to them are they actually going to be allowed to access it to do any administration. This is a really good defense, a really good element of a posture, and it ties access to a business process, which is which I think is really cool. Uh, and then finally, the employee subnet. If you're an employee, then you get access to everything on this this subnet, which happens to be a slash sixteen subnet. So lots and lots of applications on there. Again, not the best access policy, but it's a good start. Okay, finally, 
as we are getting low on time here, uh, the monitor and maintain aspect of this, clearly we want to be able to feed our identity and rich logs into our SIM so that our SOC analyst can look at this. And this data allows us to much more clearly distinguish between if we're blocking access, are we blocking legitimate access? In which case, okay, we need to add, adjust the policy or adapt uh, the inputs to it. Or is it anomalous access? In which case we better jump on this because something bad is going on. Likewise, if this is actually allowed, but there's some sort of deviation from a baseline, it warrants an investigation. Like someone is now downloading 10 times a normal amount of, of data. Okay, that's weird. Maybe it's an insider threat. Maybe it's the end of the quarter and there, or maybe there's just some process going on that is legitimate. It's worth us looking at it so that this doesn't become a false positive in the future. Um, and if it's anomalous access, of course, we got to jump on it. And then finally, uh, this logging, monitoring, and maintaining is going to let us uh, put in place a plan to improve the granularity of uh, Protect Surface B, which today grants everyone access to everything on that whole subnet. So to wrap up here, um, if you haven't taken a look at the NSTAC report, I would say so. If you're not a federal agency, or specifically if you're not you know, in a certain role, you can ignore uh, most of the NSTAC report, but do, do take a look at the definitions for the DAS element, the Kipling method, and the five-step process. Um, please go ahead and read uh, CSA's documents on this, the defining the protect surface, which is already out there, and the step two documents, which should be out there uh, in Q4 of this year. And please get involved in our working group. We're always looking for volunteers. Uh, we love talking to people about this. Uh, as I mentioned, we've got step three work in progress right now, and steps four and five are in the, in the planning phase. So with that, I want to thank you. Um, I'm always happy to connect with people. You can reach me on LinkedIn at the URL there, uh, and you can get more information about the types of things that I do um, at numberlinesecurity.com. Um, and I want to thank the CSA for the opportunity to present, and have a great day. Thank you.